good evening. Thank you for joining me. It's so great to be um, collaborating with the Mummy MOT again this evening. I absolutely love um, speaking to the Mummy MOT team because I think everything that they talk about in terms of postnatal recovery and postnatal care is so important and so neglected. So thank you for having me on your Instagram again. And it's great that so many people are joining. Um, so give me a little wave just to make sure that you can hear me and that the sound and things is all working. Um, and I'll just give everyone a few minutes to join us and then we'll get talking about um, the really important but kind of neglected subject, I suppose, of um, perineal tearing and trauma for childbirth. Hello, lovely to see all these waves. Brilliant. Now I will answer questions as we go, so please feel free if you've got any questions about what we're talking about, just pop it in the comments and, and I will keep sort of scrolling through and try and answer those questions for you as we go along. Fantastic. Hello everybody. So I think it's really useful to start with just to discuss what the perineum actually is because quite often we talk about perineal trauma but lots of ladies can't quite pinpoint where that is on their body. So the perineum is essentially the um, area between your vaginal opening and your back passage. So that area of skin and muscle is what we refer to as the perineum. And that's the area that is most susceptible to damage or, or tearing and trauma during childbirth because of the stretching that obviously has to happen for your baby's head to come out. And it is very common in childbirth for there to be some damage or trauma to that area of the perineum. It can also sometimes involve the vaginal wall um, and sometimes you get tears of like the urethra or the clitoris. And some of the more uh, complex tears can also involve the anal sphincter and some of the fibres around the anus. So we'll talk about the different types of tears as we, as we go along this evening. Now, for first-time mums, is about nine out of 10 women will experience some degree of tearing. And the overall statistics for all women giving birth vaginally is about 85%. So it's really large numbers. And despite that, it seems to be really neglected and a little bit of a taboo subject for us to talk about. So it's really brilliant that so many people are joining us to go through it today. Um, it's important that you empower yourself with an understanding of what could happen to your body during childbirth so that you can prepare for that both physically and, and also psychologically, because it's quite a big change um, to happen to your body. So the, um, as we said, it can happen to your areas of your vagina, your perineal area, and sometimes the labia, clitoris, um, urethra, and anal sphincter muscles. And for most women, these um, types of tears will be sutured in your um, room that you've given birth, and they should heal with kind of no further complications. Now we do tend to define perineal trauma into types of tearing that occur. So we've got our first degree tears, which are kind of the lesser, I suppose, of the damage that could occur. And this is usually just the kind of skin of the perineal um, area, no muscle damage. And usually these will heal quite nicely on their own. If they're not bleeding and they're nicely aligned, you may not even need any stitches at all for these first degree tears. And then second degree tears. So these are where it also involves the muscle of the um, perineum and the vaginal wall. So if you imagine, if you have your um, hand like sort of this shape, this is kind of the perineal area. So if you imagine a little nick, that would be your first degree skin tears. And then if that was to go slightly further down um, and a little bit deeper, that's what we're looking at with our second degree tears. Now, generally, we would recommend suturing of all second degree tears on the perineum. And these sutures that are used are generally dissolvable sutures, and this can be done in your room that you've given birth in or at home if that's where you've chosen to have your baby. Um, and we just give some local anaesthetic. If you've got an epidural, you might not feel it anyway, but usually they're just done with some, some local anaesthetic. Now, you may have also heard of a term called an episiotomy, and this is where we do a um, deliberate incision into that perineal muscle, and it generally involves the same structures as the second degree tears that we just talked about. But the main difference is that it's a deliberate cut rather than your body tearing naturally. Now, thankfully, episiotomies are no longer done routinely in the UK. It did used to be the case sort of in the 80s and early 90s. 
And what this does is helps to open the vaginal opening a little wider to make your baby be born a bit quicker. So if we've got concerns about your baby's heartbeat and we know that your baby's coming out vaginally, but that process just needs to speed up a little bit, that might be an indication for an episiotomy to be recommended. Another indication is if we are concerned that you may have a more severe type of tear, so these third and fourth degree tears which approach on the anal sphincter muscles. And sometimes there's some early signs where your midwife or obstetrician might be concerned that that might happen and they may then recommend an episiotomy as a method of trying to prevent that more extensive trauma from occurring for you. Often if ladies have a forceps birth, then the episiotomy may occur as well. And that again is to reduce that risk of those more severe tears because of the insertion of the forceps into the vagina. It does kind of overstretch a little bit. So that's the episiotomies. And then the third and fourth degree tears that I just touched on. So for some women, and it's about 2.9% of women, the perineal trauma is deeper and more complex and then it goes into the anal sphincter. Now third degree tears are generally categorized into A, B and C. And what those letters refer to is how much of the anal sphincter has been damaged from the tear. And then your fourth degree tear is where the trauma has extended all the way into the anal epithelial layer as well. Now these type of tears will need to be repaired by an obstetrician who is trained in suturing of third and fourth degree tears. And these are almost exclusively sutured in a theater. And there's really good reason for that. One is that we want to make sure that you are pain-free during the repair because it does take a little bit longer, all right? And it's easier for the obstetrician if you're able to stay very still because you're completely comfortable so that we can make sure that, that repair is done really, really well for you. The other important thing is position and lighting. So in um, our delivery rooms, we have this lovely mood lighting, which is great for birth, but not so good for suturing a complicated tear. So that's why it was really important that's done in theatre for you with good analgesia. So that may be if you already have an epidural, it might be that that's sufficient. If you don't, then it's likely you'll be advised that you have a spinal anaesthetic. I've just seen a couple of questions. So how long does it take for the internal episiotomy scar to heal properly? I'm eight weeks and I can still feel a throbbing pain around my internal scar. It's very difficult to, to give you a kind of a definitive time scale, if you like, because everybody heals at different rates. And depending on kind of all the other, other factors around your birth, that might either slow down or speed up the, the, the kind of time it takes that trauma to repair. What I would say is generally, the kind of pain sensation should get less as time goes on, okay? And if you... If you're finding that actually suddenly the pain's getting worse or things aren't improving, it's really, really important that you go and seek some support from your GP because generally the sort of second degree episiotomy tear shouldn't cause you any long-term damage and, and, and sort of pain. So if you're finding that symptoms aren't improving, please, I would encourage you to go and see your GP um, and make sure there's no signs of infection and that the kind of anatomy has healed at a nice, um, even in a nice even way so that it shouldn't be causing you any trouble and just leading on from that the other thing I always advise ladies is if you're finding that following a perineal repair you're experiencing pain with intercourse or doing some activities that you used to do pain free that's another reason that you must go and seek some support because your trauma your perineal trauma shouldn't cause ongoing pain with intercourse in the, in the initial period, sometimes it is uncomfortable because of the changes that have happened, but that shouldn't be a long-term issue. Okay, no, you're more than welcome. I'm pleased we can answer it. Okay, I had a th third degree tear and my stitches have come undone. Is this normal? Why don't they restitch it? So the reason that we don't restitch it is because if there is an infection, what we don't want to do is trap the infection inside, if that makes sense. And generally with your um, perineum, what happens is the healing begins internally and then it heals outwards. So the last thing to heal is your skin. So quite often, although they've started to come open, 
the muscle layers may have healed and it's just the skin that will usually heal together on its own just with some antibiotics if they've identified an infection. I'm assuming um, from, from your question that you've already so, sort of seen some medical assistance. Obviously, if you haven't, I'd recommend doing that because we need to assess, the, assess, assess your tear and, and see if there is an infection or anything we need to do. All right. And the other important thing is that ladies that have sustained a third or a fourth degree tear will also be seen by a physiotherapist in the postnatal period. And that's really important for your pelvic floor exercises and re-strengthening that area. Because we do know that if you have sustained one of these more complex tears, you have an increased risk of incontinence issues and prolapse issues in later life. Although the evidence does show that sort of 60 to 80% of women 12 months later are um, asymptomatic of this. It's important that we make sure you have the proper recovery. You'll also have a follow-up appointment in a clinic with one of the consultant obstetricians. And that's again, just to make sure that everything seems to have healed well um, and that there's hopefully gonna be a real minimal risk of you having ongoing problems. So that I think sort of summarizes the potential types of um, perineal trauma that you could sustain and demystify some of the um, some of the some of the vocabulary you might be used to hearing around that around this um, issue. Now the other thing that I find um, women quite often will um, talk about is perineal massage, and um, so perineal massage is the kind of antenatal stretching and massaging of that perineal area with the hope to try and reduce the risk of perineal trauma following childbirth. And there's been loads of um, reviews conducted recently looking into this, into this kind of relatively new, I suppose, intervention. Now there was a really great Cochrane review of four trials, it was about two and a half thousand women, and the evidence showed that by performing perineal massage for about three to four minutes, from 35 weeks of pregnancy, one to two times a week. So but do, by doing it more, it didn't have any impact. So that's all you would need to, need to do if you were considering it. And then it might reduce the um, risk of perineal trauma, especially in first time mums. And it mainly seemed to reduce the risk of episiotomies, more so than natural tearings. Now you can, the evidence isn't amazing and it's not concrete, but what I would say is if it is something that's concerning you, it's something that you can start to implement yourself, which is quite empowering and sometimes quite reassuring to feel like you're doing something and that it's not gonna cause you any damage. So although the, the kind of evidence for the benefits isn't exceptional, there isn't gonna be any harm. So it's absolutely something to give a go and um, if you feel comfortable doing so. It is really important that you do it correctly um, and there is lots of advice on the internet on how to do it. I can go into it on another video but it's, it's, a, it's take a little bit longer. Um, a little question, I brought the oil for perineum but when I realised how to do the massage I couldn't do it. Really interesting, I wonder whether you've tried using a mirror because sometimes when you are heavily pregnant it can be quite tricky to see whether you're in the correct area. Um, so if you have a mirror in front of you and good oils, then that's really useful. And you want to put your kind of thumbs into the back wall of your vagina. And it's kind of like a U-shaped um, mechanism to try and just gently stretch those tissues. And perineal massage shouldn't hurt. So it might feel a little bit stretchy to start with, but it shouldn't be um, uncomfortable or, or really hurting you. So if it is, then just think about readjusting your position um, on that as well, and maybe adding in a little bit more of the lubricating oil. And the other thing that we can do in childbirth is using warm compresses at the time of giving birth. So again, there was another Cochrane review that looked at 22 trials and about 15,000 women. And it showed that for women who had a warm compress popped around the perineal area when they were giving birth to their babies, it reduced the risk slightly of those third and fourth degree more complex tears. And, and kind of anecdotally, I suppose, in my practice, what I found is that the use of warm compresses, women quite often find soothing at that stage. So this is the stage when your baby's head is crowning, so it's sat on your perineum, everything's really stretched, and sometimes just having a, a flannel or some gauze or a pad just soaked in some warm water can just really help with that kind of stinging, burning sensation at that point. So if that's something that you'd be interested in trying, then just have a little chat to your midwife when you um, go into labour. 
And most midwives are more than happy to do that because again, it's one of those things where there's no harm. So although we can't say the evidence is amazing because it's so difficult to ethically do research on pregnant ladies for good reason, it's something that's not gonna cause any harm. So we've kind of got nothing to lose. And then I think the really important thing we discuss for ladies that have sustained some degree of, degree of perineal trauma is how to care for that in the postnatal period. Um, and I've just seen a message that said that a lady hasn't seen as many people um, postnatally at the moment because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And that's a really difficult thing, I think, for, for anyone having a baby or pregnant at the moment. So making sure that you care for your trauma will help to reduce the risk of infection, which is really important for healing. So making sure you keep the area clean and dry, washing your hands before and after you go to the toilet. So everyone's obviously used to doing it afterwards, but it's really important that you wash it before as well. Otherwise, any bacteria that are already on your hands, you're going to put into that wound when you're wiping yourself. Continu continuing to wipe um, front to back so that you're not in bringing any of the bacteria from your back passage into the trauma area and changing your pads really regularly. So what you don't want is a dirty um, pad, because obviously you're bleeding at this stage, sat around that perineal trauma area while it's trying to heal. So keeping the area clean, dry, changing your pads nice and regularly, um, and accept offers from your community midwife or healthcare provider to examine your stitches. It's really important that we kind of Feel, feel okay with doing this because it will help us to identify any infections that might be on the horizon early and therefore get you on some treatment to reduce the risk of these longer term complications as well. So having a look. The other thing you can do is it's your body. So it's really important you get used to seeing it as well. So using a little mirror so that you can visualize it because actually you can look at it regularly. So if there are any signs of infection, you're then gonna be able to pick that up nice and early and seek some support. People are always really worried to look at their perineum after giving birth to their baby, but thankfully we are lots of skilled practitioners in suturing perineums. So actually women look at it and then feel really reassured. So that's what I would say is don't, don't feel worried about looking at your own body. It's just birth your baby. So be proud of it and help to look after it. And as we said before, so generally perineal trauma should get less painful as the kind of healing process um, proceeds. So if you're finding that your pain was getting better and then all of a sudden you've suddenly got an extra surge of more discomfort, then that could again be a sign of infection. So speaking to your GP or your midwife or healthcare professional is really important. And to speak, speak up if you find that you're having longer term issues, like we said. So the most common one really is pain with intercourse. Um, and it, and we don't need to, you don't need to be suffering with that. There's lots of things that we can, we can do to help you. So please do seek support if, if that's an issue for you as well. Okay, pelvic floor exercises, the last thing I would recommend in the, the postnatal period before we, before we leave you for your um, Thursday evening. So really important pelvic floor exercises. During pregnancy and childbirth, your pelvic floor is, is weakened and stretched to allow for the pregnancy and to give birth to your baby. So it's really important we re-strengthen that, especially in the postnatal period. And weak pelvic floor exercises can increase your risk again of having um, prolapse of those pelvic organs. So your pelvic floor is like a hammock of muscle that holds your bladder, your bowel, your, your womb, all in place. So if they become slack, there's that risk of prolapse. So really important that you practice those regularly and when it's comfortable to do so. So for some people that might be the next day, for some people that'll be in six, eight weeks time. So just listen to your body. It's quite common that ladies um, following childbirth will try to perform their pelvic floors and find that it's quite difficult compared to how it was previously or that they can't quite pinpoint that position. But if you persevere, thankfully they've got really good muscle memory. So by continuously practicing that technique, you will be able to strengthen them up, which is really important. So I really hope that our chat this evening has helped to kind of, I guess, demystify um, perineal trauma. It's one of those things, although it's really common, ladies don't speak about, so as if 
as midwives, if we're not speaking about it either, then we aren't going to be able to get the message out there. So I'm really grateful for you joining me. And I'd really encourage you to start speaking about this issue with, with friends and family so that we can normalise it and help women to not feel kind of alone or, or concerns about it and realise actually it's quite a normal part of the childbirth process. So if you want to give the um, some of the little techniques we spoke, to, spoke about a go, that's brilliant. I'd love to know how you get on if you do give some perineal massage techniques a go. Um, and otherwise, enjoy your evening and thank you for tuning in. Take care. Bye-bye.